So we've got four uh, excellent speakers, and, and, and this is really, business sustainability is obviously a pretty big topic, and it's a quite a large one to try and crack uh, in an hour and a half of anyone's time. So, so, so the way we'll make this work is it'll be a sort of facilitated panel discussion, really, uh, and we'll have two speakers uh, speak uh, at the outset, and, and we'll stop at that point and throw it open to the audience to ask some questions and get the discussion going. And we'll, have, we'll run that for a while, and then uh, the other two speakers will, uh, will, will, will finish us off at the end. Um, of the speakers, these are an excellent, excellent list of speakers we have. Uh, we have, starting, will be Jeremy Bentham, who is the senior, vi uh, is the vice president of Global Business Environment at Shell, and he's been responsible in that role since 2006. And his team is best known for developing forward-looking scenarios to support the company's strategic thinking and decision setting. Uh, Jeremy joined uh, uh, Shell in 1980, following postgrad experience at Caltech, and he's a physics graduate from Oxford. So he'll be opening, and he'll be followed by Jamie Butterworth, and Jamie is the former CEO of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, which is a global hub for circular economy innovation. Jamie's developed a deep understanding of how the circular economy drives value, working with a number of the world's leading brands to support them in successfully de deploying circular business models. So with that, um, could I please ask uh, Jeremy if he wouldn't mind opening the discussion? Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Goodness me. <coughs> Can I just second what was said earlier about uh, you know, please make it a stimulating discussion? Because it is cold. Cold <laughs> <laughs> it was. You kind of appreciate energy when it's cold and dark. You know, it's kind of cold, it's cold dark. Um, uh, having been an undergraduate here, uh, I understand uh, how you feel about uh, kind of old guys like me coming to talk to you. So, kind of put that aside and let's have a good discussion about uh, what we're talking about. Uh, and I also understand that it, it's almost mandatory to begin a discussion here with some kind of quote from a literary master. So, uh, because time is in the, uh, uh, the advertisement for this discussion, you should say something about the Jeffy Chaucer, uh, time, the time waits for an old man. So, that's my kind of segue into saying, this is an important time, an interesting time. We're one week away from the discussions on the climate challenge in Paris. And so I think all of us will probably make some reference to that in the discussion that we have. Uh, and I as an individual, and, and we as a company are very supportive, want to see some kind of uh, truly meaningful agreements forged and coming out of uh, that particular gathering. If nothing else, uh, it's an architecture that can help really that we're seeing an orderly transition over the coming decades rather than a disorderly, ineffective type of transition. But we hope that there is some recognition of the importance of market mechanisms in that uh, set of agreements, uh, because we believe that those are the engines which drive change and transition uh, over time. Uh, and finally, we hope that that terrible area of discussion that seems to be holding up progress in this area for many years uh, gets a good area. That, that's the funding issue, the investment issues. Uh, very much the environmental issues seem to get sidelined by those. Uh, and I think that there's an important lesson in that. Uh, I think there's an important lesson about there being two great imperatives in our times. One of them is associated with economic development, and the other one with safeguarding the environment. Uh, and because these get mixed, and because of the concerns in the minority world, in the majority world, sorry, uh, about their capacity to develop and uh, the ability to attract investment and funding for that, it gets tied up and can be a real hurdle. So for me, one of the great successes of Paris will also to be seeing some kind of progress uh, in those, those areas as well. Uh, so I'm going to say a few words about how we see both of those particular imperatives. Um, 
if we're going to have a world which, simply put, is able to have the kinds of activities that bring a decent quality of life to the majority, and have that with net zero emissions, which ultimately is what is required to stabilize the pressure that humanity is putting on the environment, uh, then there's going to be a huge amount of investment. We are going to have to see uh, building of homes, of water systems, of transport infrastructures, <coughs> of workshops, of factories, of waste systems. There's going to have to be a lot of stuff. And in order to have a lot of stuff, a lot of activity, then I, as a kind of foreign physicist, know you need a lot of energy to do that. Uh, and even with heroic assumptions about energy efficiency, you're going to see a world in which you're going to have approximately twice the size of the energy system you have today if you're going to be able to have that decent quality of life for everyone. And you're going to try and realize that with net zero emissions. So it's more energy with fewer emissions. Uh, and just to give you a sense of that, um, because you know, these kinds of things don't come easy to mind, uh, on average, every man, woman, and child in Europe to sustain the kind of quality of life that we have uh, has the equivalent of 150 full-time physical laborers working for them. So the kind of the average family has around 600. And it's one of the reasons that we are able to live essentially like pharaohs if you compare them uh, with, with, with ancient times. Uh, so it's very important to recognize that we are going to be growing the system to get a decent quality of life and transforming the nature of it if you're going to have net zero emissions. Now if we look at that challenge of net zero emissions, it's clear that renewable forms of energy are going to play an important role. One of the things that people sometimes don't like is that they can't be a silver bullet. And it's largely because, if you think about it, when most people are thinking about renewable energies, they're often referring to solar and wind, which are growing rapidly, although they're still a small part of the system. Uh, and of course, solar and wind are ways of producing electricity. And people sometimes confuse electricity with energy. Uh, globally, electricity is the channel for less than a fifth of global energy use. So um, if you're going to have an increasingly significant contribution from things like solar and wind and triangle and other forms, then you're talking about deeper and deeper electrification of the whole economy. And so then you've got to really look in detail at the sectors of the economy and what is feasible over what time scales within them. Uh, so if you're looking at uh, the residential sector or the commercial sector, <coughs> you can kind of see the route to that. Uh, you can see how you can bring heat pumps into buildings, insulation into buildings, and uh, cook with electricity, etc., etc. So uh, that can be politically difficult, because in the UK it's going to uh, require going into uh, most of the uh, people's houses in the UK over the coming decades and seeing transitions there. But technically, it's very feasible. You can see a route towards that. Uh, if you look towards light duty transport, uh, city vehicles, uh, you can see the route towards electrification there, either the back electric vehicles, or, uh, fuel cell electric vehicles. Uh, if you start looking towards other forms of transport, heavy duty, long distance freight, uh, aeroplanes, etc. It becomes more difficult because you need those concentrated um, uh, high density and high energy density fuels like um, uh, like oil, like biofuels that, uh, that we currently see. 
And if you look into other areas, uh, as you're trying to build this decent world, when you're looking at iron manufacture, cement manufacture, steel manufacture, these almost, in the nature of their processes, will emit. Uh, if you're looking at petrochemicals, if you're looking at <coughs> plastics, you need high temperature furnaces, and electricity isn't the route towards high temperature furnaces, unless there's a huge amount of technical development to enable that. So what you really have then is a situation where you can see that some sectors are going to develop more slowly than others, and to transition more slowly than others, as well as some countries are clearly going to be transitioning more slowly than others. So if you're going to reach net zero emissions quickly, you're going to have to realize that you, you have to have negative emissions. You're going to have to have a way of <coughs> carbon dioxide capture and storage to mop up existing emissions and combine that with sustainably farmed uh, biofuels, biomass gasification of carbon dioxide capture and storage in order to have ultimately negative emissions to offset the remaining emissions. And you're not going to get those without the kinds of policy developments, uh, whether that's uh, carbon pricing mechanisms, that actually put a value on and incentivize investments in those kinds of technologies. So if we look at this completely, you, know, you see that there are many challenges. Uh, and then again, you come towards the time horizons. Uh, and hopefully, these challenges can be addressed within a reasonable time horizon. It's what we would all like to see. If I think of it further and come back to those kinds of literary quotes I was talking about, one of my favorite quotes is uh, from Shakespeare. Uh, and it's that um, there is a, a tide in the affairs of men which, taken at the flood, leads on to fortune. And I think we are at a time now where we have to seize the time at its flood. And it can be quite inspiring. I think it's an inspiring prospect with a universe of opportunities and possibilities from the real technological to the real policy end to make a difference and have a decent quality of life for everyone in net zero emissions. So, thank you for your attention, and I hope that stimulates some questions. Jeremy, thanks very much for, uh, for that speech and for framing some of the issues that we're here to try to talk about. For a different perspective, uh, we're going to have Jamie Butterworth from American Capital uh, to give his respect. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Uh, I guess I'll just ask to begin with, so who here thinks time and space are the enemies of business sustainability? Okay, who here thinks that they are the allies of business sustainability? So a lot of people don't have an opinion, is that right? <laughs> I'm going to force you into making an opinion now. Who thinks that time and space are the enemies? Come on. That's a few more people actually think that they are. And who think that, in fact, they're the allies, that they're a good thing? Okay, so we've got a kind of split, really. Okay, so I'm going to try and talk about the fact that time and space are the allies of business sustainability. If we look at... You yeah. don't have anything between this four position. <laughs> <laughs> Say again? Any soft policy? Yeah, I have real soft policy. That's what I'm coming to now, exactly. Yeah. So I'm going to argue that... Um, they're the allies if you look at the problem in the right way. Yeah? Um, and in fact, I think if this was a traditional uh, kind of academic debate, we would be arguing one point versus the other quite hard. But we've decided to tone it down and kind of take a bit of a middle ground. So just for those people who love academic debates, it may be disappointing. For those people who like the middle ground, it might be more interesting. OK, so I'm, uh, one of the things I was thinking about before I came in here was the way that the economy tends to work. And it's very kind of linear. We tend to dig something out the ground, turn that into a material or a product, sell it into a market, and then chuck it out at the end of its life. And this is kind of the throughput of GDP or economic growth in many instances. And through that process, we rely on very large quantities of mainly fossil fuel energy 
and mainly virgin inputs and commodities and resources. And since we started doing that, kind of back in the 1900s at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, we've seen the fastest period of human economic development in history. So it's been enormously helpful in terms of helping people to have the type of life that we have to do today, as Jeremy said. And there are a number of um, interesting factors about that, however, which are potentially problematic. So if we look at what we mean from a sustainability perspective, um, and I, I looked at a paper by Rockstrom that looked at what are the biggest planetary risks that we now have. And interestingly enough, climate change isn't number one. So number one, biosphere integrity. Number two um, is nitrogen and phosphate availability within the economy for food and farming. Number three is land use change. And number four is climate change. Um, and the more that we look into this topic, and you guys probably know this better than we do, working, being in the School of Geography, there are a number of risks and a number of elements that might make business as usual not uh, sustainable. And this is before we see an additional 3 billion more middle class consumers join the economy. And to put that in context, because it's a big number, that's the same number of people as there are in London, um, about 8 million people joining the economy every 32 days. So every month, the number of people in London consuming at the level that we do, which is pretty staggering. And so in one year, for example, we'll, it's the equivalent um, infrastructure development of 25 cities the size of Chicago being built, uh, which is mainly through China and India, every year on year on year. So the amount of throughput that we require to make that work is absolutely um, staggering. Um, so if time and space are, are, are the, uh, if time and space are a factor, um, then my thought is that they are the enemies of business sustainability if we don't use that feedback. So if we don't use the feedback as to what is actually happening to feed back into the market system. And I think this is when it comes down to what we mean by time. So from a business context, and we're all people from businesses, five years is a really long time, right? A year is quite a long time. Five years is a really long time. 40 years, might as well forget about it. I mean, 40 years time, it's outside of the scope of at least when I'll be in my job role and probably, you know, you're basically talking about very long cycles. Um, what I was interested in in this topic was actually we're probably wanting to look at an economy that works in hundreds, if not thousands of years time. I mean, uh, living systems have existed for about 2.8 billion years. Um, humans have been on the planet for about 100, 200,000 years. And ultimately, I imagine that we would like to have a prosperous economy. We'd like to have human development in 100, 200, 1,000 years time. So I was kind of pondering this question myself. And my thought was that if we use the current measure for progress, which is GDP, and we use that because it's easy to measure effectively. We've used GDP for a very long time. It's very easy to account for. We may have some issues. And my thought around that is that ultimately, as the system stands right now, we are not able to internalize many of the externalities in the system. Um, so, for example, if we go back to the points that I made earlier about ecosystem degradation, the um, current economy and the economic setup we have now leaks seven to eight million tons of plastics into the world's oceans each year. And that has an impact on uh, fisheries, it has an impact on aquaculture systems. And that's actually been measured by an organization called TrueCost at being a many billion US dollar cost to the, to the economy. Um, so my uh, kind of take on this is that if you are able to actually internalize those externalities, then the market system will operate properly. And even more excitingly than that, I think there's two other developments that are happening simultaneously. One is the Internet of Things, which basically means that the cost of being able to, being able to sense many of these elements has been completely impossible in the past and not even worth thinking about. Whereas we know now that it is easy to sense many more variables, whether it's clean air, clean water, whatever that happens to be in the economy, in the future it may be possible to internalize those and take them into account. The second is an area that I'm very interested, maybe slightly biased towards because I work in it, is the circular economy, where I believe that you can start to shift this linear take, make, dispose economy to one where by design you have a loop of technical materials 
which are designed by intent to cycle at the highest possible quality, which starts to decouple the manufacturing economy from the use of energy. And in the biological side of the economy, we start to design flows of biological nutrients to be able to restore and add value through the bi biosphere. And in this instance, I think to quote Michael Braungart, one of the authors of a book called Cradle to Cradle, he says, he talks about uh, sustainability. And he says, if I told you that th my relationship I have with my wife was sustainable, what would you think? And his point is ultimately you need a lens for innovation that goes beyond just surviving and being sustainable and you need a way of looking at building a future economy which is better than today's. So my thought is this does work but you need to change the system operating conditions so the market system internalizes the externalities and you need to look at the world from a different lens of innovation. So thank you. Jamie, thanks very much for that. So, uh, from living with Pharaohs, living at Pharaohs, I should say, through to feeding back to the market, we're going to pause the speakers from their speeches now and just have have this open to the to the floor slightly. Uh, and we're looking for questions around what they've said, but obviously more widely than that, we have speakers who haven't yet spoken. So uh, let's let, let, let's start with that. So, do I need a mic? Oh yes, I'm sorry. Would you, would you wouldn't mind to record? The mic and yeah. Yep, so my name is Rafael, I'm a uh, PhD student here at the department. And I was just wondering, uh, I'm on the, on the side of things that time and space are enemies of business sustainability. And I was thinking quite uh, interestingly, uh, Jeremy Benton have, uh, pre have, uh, have, has presented a very utilitarian uh, perspective, let's say, quite uh, coincidentally, on like presenting this optimistic idea that um, business will be able to, we are in a very good uh, moment in time where business will be able to bring benefits to the majority of the people when, uh, with zero, net zero emissions. But I was thinking about how to some extent this optimism comes at the price that not really paying too attention about the, the difficulties of inequalities in space and the time window we have to, to tackle climate change. Okay, well thanks, thanks for that. We'll just that. On that. Sure. I have to agree with you, because uh, if you looked at uh, the way that we looked at our scenarios um, 20 years ago, uh, the expectation is that as a global society, we would be further along than now. Uh, and so, indeed, the uh, social, political <coughs> and economic dynamics uh, have worked against the rate of constructive development that, that you would want to see. So in that sense, you can be positive, you can be um, a pessimist because if you look back at those times. Uh, I think that um, wallowing in that pessimism isn't a, a particularly good way forward. Uh, and I do think that uh, you can see, um, technically and economically, a path forward, a very challenging and very difficult path, but a path with light at the end of the tunnel. But it does involve transforming basically every sector of the economy. Uh, it's not about uh, particularly the energy producers, although it includes that. It's every sector of the economy. And you have to go through almost methodically looking at each sector and how it can be transformed. And also whether the business models that we have today will make those innovations reach the places where are most which, which are most yep. in need, especially poor poor areas in the world where uh, consumption levels are still very low compared to rich areas, but could increase. And anyway, oh. so any, anyone else on the panel want to add to that? Uh, well, if I may add, um, I think one of the useful framing tools that have just been uh, announced at a global level are the Sustainable Development Goals. And I think if um, those are embedded in business thinking and in investment thinking, then I think we stand a chance of um, dealing with inequity as well. But um, I'm going to I'm going to be saying a little bit more about the world of finance when it comes to my talk. So I don't want to say much more at this point. But I, I do think that is a very um, useful framing as long as it is embraced as much as we hope we'd like it to be by um, politics and business alike. 
Uh, thank you. My name is Dr. Stanislav Schmelev. I used to lead an uh, in introductory workshop on ecological economics at this uh, department for the students. Uh, if I may add, the problem in the title is to a large extent for me uh, hidden in the development of economic science as a, as a system of views. And uh, more specifically, uh, the issues of time and space have been almost absolutely lacking in the education of traditional economists. And that's partly the issue we, we're having with you know, sustainability at a larger scale. The question I, or you know, the provocative element that I wanted to throw out was um, the market mechanisms. Uh, if you look at the uh, decarbonization as it happened in some countries where it did, uh, introduction of nuclear energy, introduction of hydro energy, what did it have to do with market mechanisms? Uh, secondly, to your knowledge, to what extent carbon trading has reduced CO2 emissions? And if you know any cases where it has, uh, I'll be really grateful. Taxation, for me, it would work in a much sort of stronger sense because I know it did work in some places. But a lot of this innovation should happen at a very, very high sort of level and at a very large scale, which very often involves, you know, some creative impulse, some roadmap, implementation plan, with, with some mechanisms, of course, but, you know, what is the role of these mechanisms? Is this everything we have to, you know, sort of pray for, or it's only a fragment in a, in a wider picture? Thank you. I'm happy to take a kick, kick off and then pass my uh, microphone around. Uh, the, um, uh, you, you, you're certainly right about the, the scale of these things uh, and um, uh, the fact that uh, innovations, as much policy innovations as other innovations, are, are required to move things forward. Uh, and to give people a sense of this, the scale of some of these things, uh, if you were to have a perfectly technically tested um, breakthrough in, in a particular area in the energy system uh, and uh, it was immediately commercially uh, employable as well, then uh, if you were really lucky, it would perhaps grow globally at 25% per year. And 25% per year, year on year, is a huge growth. You know, you're, you're inventing new industries, having to train people. 25% year on year, cumulative, for 30 years <coughs> gets you 1% of the global energy system because the system is so large, because so much of our uh, um, uh, economy depends upon it. Uh, and you know, the point there is uh, you need both the innovation and you need to deploy it and deploy it. And that's where the market mechanisms come on because that creates the engine for repeated deployment. Just some thoughts on that. Anyone else have something to comment on in terms of the role of the market? In these? So, I mean, I think when I think of things like the shift from linear to circular and the industrialized, um, like corporates working in that space, um, if you think of, so one, one example of a company that's done something interesting and has been partly driven by the market, but also partly driven by innovation would be someone like uh, Renault, the French automotive manufacturer. So they have for years been trying to use less energy and fuel in making their vehicles and less materials. And between 2010 and 2011, the price of input commodities, mainly steel, copper and polymer, went up by 500 million euros. And that factored in at about the same time that they'd got some interesting people in to look at the business model by which they sold their vehicles and the way they got things back out the market. They set up this plant outside of Paris called Choisy Leroy, where they can take a vehicle at the end of its life, they can take the steel, the, the metal, the, the polymers and things out of it, normal stuff. They can also take the drivetrain, the engine, the gearbox. They can deconstruct them, remanufacture them into as new, if not better condition, and sell them back into the market with the same warranty as a new product. When they do that, they use 80% less energy, 70% of the original materials. So they've totally changed. They've decoupled their economic growth from resource constraints, potentially. Did they act in a response to some kind of regulation? So I think there were, this is what I'm trying to say, I think there were multiple factors. So I think they had some innovative, interesting people with a different way of looking at things. It was also about the same time that they were working out how they were going to sell electric vehicles. 
And the trouble with an electric vehicle at that point, they thought, was that the battery system made up nearly 50% of the value of the vehicle. So they decided to start selling some cars and leasing you the battery system because the cost of charging the battery system was less expensive. So it was an innovative finance solution. That then made them an asset owner of the battery. So it became in their interest to start upgrading or designing it differently to get it back into their business. So I think many things happened. But crucially for me, it wasn't just about saying we're going to try and make vehicles using less energy and less materials. They fundamentally changed the business model and the design of their product and the way they sold it to their customers to have a different type of operating model. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Matthew. I'm an MSc student here at the School of Geography. I was just wondering if each of the panelists, um, perhaps those who have spoken can answer it first and then the next two in the talks, can give a, a definition of what they think business sustainability is. Um, we recently, my uh, master's course, had a workshop on cultural models and we realized that not everyone actually understands sustainability as the same thing. So, uh, well, perhaps the people that spoke first would... Uh, well, it, it, it is very interesting, and uh, um, I think that uh, people may articulate it in different ways, uh, but I think it does start with a culture that recognizes uh, you can't have a sustainable business in a failing world, uh, and so kind of recognizes that uh, your business is one part of the societal system uh, which brings forward uh, you know, the ability to uh, be the um, uh, the arms and the legs of society, uh, and has a role in that, uh, in doing that in a responsible way that contributes uh, to uh, society, both in what it does, uh, but also in what it promotes. <coughs> well. Did you say that you did a project where you looked into this? We were looking at cultural models, and one one of the, one of the things we were looking at was sustainability, and we were thinking of ways to, uh, to define it amongst ourselves and thus different activities. So, trying to identify the common components of definitions, li listing um, first things in your head, that kind of. Exercise. Did you reach a consensus as to what business no. sustainability was? Because I I think exactly the same thing. I I actually saw the title initially had no idea what it was meant, meant and asked some of the cleverest people I know and they didn't either. And then um, I, I kind of looked up what business means and it means activities that we tend to do the most of, I think was the answer and sustainability was pretty various in its description. So I thought when I was kind of giving my part that it was our ability to have human economic development, maybe with some other bits to it and for that to be able to continue in a sustainable manner and get better. Um, but it's, uh, I, I agree that that is a really uh, important point, and I think that there isn't that much of a definition for what that is, probably. And if, if I could add right now, because otherwise I'll forget to weave it in, um, I think one of the best um, ways I've heard it articulated is um, in the title of a, a lecture that I went to recently, which was about no jo jobs on a dead planet. And I think, again, that um, really does point to the long term and just gives a very stark um, reason why businesses and societies need to look at long term sustainability. Leo, did you want to say anything at this stage? <laughs> You're saving up. <laughs> uh, thank, thank you, panel. So, I don't think I can. Oh, I might. I, mean, I, should, I should probably point out at this point that the, 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 notion, the motion was my brilliant idea. <laughs> <laughs> Which I've been pretty thoroughly rinsed for when this was finished. It's just you're much Which cleverer than we are. You know. <laughs> so, sorry. Yes. Um, hi. Uh, I'm a PhD student at, at this department as well. And my question was uh, regarding um, uh, reliance on, on market mechanisms. Where we, when, when we say that, you know, um, basically the responsibility is on businesses to be sustainable. And I was just wondering, like in light of, let's say, the, the recent scandal with Volkswagen, where do you, do you feel that we're actually putting too much pressure or whether we're putting too much responsibility on businesses to actually come up with solutions and be sustainable where they are actually forced to cheat 
and um, basically take away the credibility of this entire sustainability. Because at the end of the day, you know, they are businesses. And I think um, I've heard these, you know, I've spoken to a few businesses where they, they always come back to their core product. That, you know, if they're a soap manufacturer, they're like, we, we manufacture soap. We are not here for the business of saving the planet, but just manufacturing our products. So I was just wondering what your opinion was regarding um, these scandals that come up and our over-reliance. Yeah, I'll, I'm as outraged about these scandals as anybody. And uh, it, you know, clearly, um, I would like to think that I don't cheat. And um, as far as I know, my company doesn't cheat. But you, you raise the interesting point of the pressures that come through. And I think that's why it's very important to kind of recognize uh, your um, participation in a bigger, bigger society and to engage in your know, vigorous discussion. Uh, you, you are part of, we are part of, I am part of uh, influencing, hopefully in a positive sense, the framework of policies in which we act uh, and informing that framework. Because very often, uh, many policymakers around the world are not experts in the kinds of subjects that we are expert in. And so you need to have that vigorous uh, debate and also have levels of transparency that others can um, see that that is being a, a good and a fair uh, debate. So uh, I don't think there's an, end, uh, an answer to it. It's certainly you know, part of uh, the modern world when we are much more connected than we have ever been uh, and hence there is much more um, uh, debate, there are much more pressure, there are m many more pressures uh, and uh, you know, that, that does kind of build up. So uh, I don't think it's an inevitable consequence but the pressures are inevitably higher than ever. And I think one of the pressures that exists is the pressure of the investor mm -hmm. and the investment community has increasingly focused its horizons on the short term. So in the time that I have worked in investment, um, that um, has, has just multiplied in, in, in terms of the, um, the I, I suppose one of, one of the ways it's articulated or seen or expressed is the number of times that um, investors will churn their portfolios in the listed equity space. And um, again, without um, taking too much of what I was going to say in a few minutes away, uh, 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 saying it right now, I think those are undoubted, those short-term pressures for companies to be performing so that, um, and the, the pressures of investment from managers to have their portfolios performing in the short term does um, create an environment which perhaps has led some individuals um, towards what we understand will be um, seen as fraudulent activity. Uh, Leo, no? <laughs> yeah, no, I think I would um, add to that completely that the uh, and from talking to some of the guys who are leading companies that are on the front edge of this, the message they seem to give is that they just want a level playing field. So in fact, as long as they know that the competition is on the same point as them, then they're happy to compete. Um, so I think in some, like in many, and this was a big discussion that's happened recently around um, our business laggards or our government's laggards. And there was a bit of a feeling about 12 months ago that actually governments were now laggards because businesses were pushing harder. But this is probably completely dependent on which particular business sector you're in. If you think your business sector is going to win in this new economy, then you may be more proactive. If you think it's going to lose, you may be less proactive. Um, but I think that the Volkswagen scandal was a massive corporate governance cock up as well. And ultimately, um, those incentives that were in place have probably helped many automotive companies to really move on. So there has been a good side to that as well, but in that particular instance it's broken down and it hasn't worked. <coughs> Where else? Well, while you're thinking of one, I mean, I mean, let me ask the question. So, so I mean, we haven't really talked about comprehensive one the panels, but, but if I could ask the panel, so, so what do they think the challenges are, or the opportunities are, for business on Paris. 
them to kick off. But well, I, I, th I think a lot of it is already being set out. Um, and one of the things that um, the team involved with putting the negotiations together has been doing over the last few years since Copenhagen ostensibly was seen to be a failure was build up um, the, the mechanism so that we are moving optimistically into the climate talks starting next week. And, and by that I mean, and we can point to, the many announcements that have been made over um, recent months and weeks by both um, businesses and governments and um, investors, all indicating that um, there is this sense of people wanting the talks to be a success. And I think um, what's interesting is that the team that's been working with Christiana Figueres is called the Groundswell team um, and has been working in the background to produce this groundswell of um, optimistic announcements that have been coming out and we'll see them continue into next week, I believe, and beyond COP21. And whilst I don't think we'll necessarily get the 100% absolutely the, the deal that we would like coming out of the discussions, we will have something that sends a very strong sense of direction to where we're heading. And, and I think that's a great place to be starting um, these talks in Paris. I think if, um, if I look at our perspective, uh, it will not surprise me that a lot of people uh, and a lot of environmental activists will be disappointed uh, after COP21. But I think they'll be missing something. Uh, and I think they'll be missing something which is uh, the efforts that have been created for an architecture that has the possibility of working and improving every five years. Uh, and so that's kind of what's been missing. And also a recognition that uh, you know, jurisdictions, coming back to the space issue before, are different. You know, we actually have you know, different legal systems in different parts of the world with different issues. And the fact that you can have nationally determined contributions, uh, but which are recognized uh, and which are uh, expected to be followed, is, is a step forward, rather than trying to have uh, what was kind of done before, which is that impossibility of taking 193 cats and herding them together. Uh, now, this is a, just a much more robust and resilient <coughs> architecture for, for the next decades. Thanks, Jeremy. I, I think what we might do is just take another pause on the questions again now and have the, sec the, sec the third and fourth part of our speakers uh, address the remarks. And then we have a bit of time after that for any other questions that may come through. So if I may, it gives my great pleasure to uh, introduce Emma Howard Boyd, who is uh, Chair of Trustees at Share Action. <coughs> Emma spent her 25-year career working in financial services, initially in corporate finance and then in fund management. So she was Director of Stewardship of Jupiter Asset Management for recently. Uh, Emma, it gives me pleasure to have you for Thank you very much. Jamie's just been sorting out my wires so I don't trip up. But, um, I've already said some of what I was planning to say um, to you, and, um, but I want to focus on one of the things that I have found um, most positive in the run-up to COP21. As Alex has said, I've spent um, nearly 25 years working in investment, and uh, sometimes it's really easy to get completely overwhelmed by um, the complexity of the issues that we're facing in relation to climate change and the need for businesses and governments to act responsibly and sustainably. And um, I think it's when you're feeling a bit wallowing, I think Jeremy was talking about wallowing in the doom and gloom. It's really important to focus on those things where we're seeing change. And one of the movements that I have, um, I think has added a huge amount to the world of investment is that of Divest Invest, where Bill McKibben a few years ago took some new analysis that was done by a group called Carbon Tracker, all of whom have been working in the investment arena and um, turned it into a very, very popular movement 
um, working in the first instance with students in the US to encourage them to ask their colleges to divest of fossil fuels from their endowment funds and then most importantly invest in alternatives. Now, um, by creating that huge noise and that um, campaign has come <coughs> over to the UK, we've had discussions at universities over here in the UK, as well as with foundations and in endowment funds, um, you've actually created a much bigger space for those working in the long-term sustainable investment movement to move into. So divest, invest is the divestment bit, if you want to do that to your portfolios where you're taking out fossil fuels, is a relatively easy and relatively crude thing to do. Very crude thing to do. But um, the, the invest side is very challenging finding where you then put your money into positive solutions. But for those investment funds who think it is too crude a tool to just to put a blanket divestment across a portfolio, they have had to up their game in terms of the engagement and the long-term stewardship that they have been conducting with their underlying portfolios, those companies in the portfolios that they have um, been, been investing in for the long term. So if I take one pension fund, I happen to chair the investment committee for it, it's the Environment Agency Pension Fund. We have 40,000 members in that pension fund and our liabilities, so, that, so this is the money that we will be paying to the members of the pension fund into their retirement, stretch into next century. Most of our people are working at the forefront of environmental regulation and dealing with climate change. So it absolutely makes sense that um, the staff that are working for the Environment Agency are interested in environmental <coughs> sustainability. But as trustees, we have decided that um, we want to look at climate risk from a risk perspective and we've just announced a policy for it, framing the investment strategy in a two degree scenario. But we're not divesting, we are decarbonizing, and we will focus on investing in renewables. We have uh, issued a policy statement saying that we want 15% of that portfolio, it's about three bi billion sterling, invested in the renewable sector over time but we're decarbonizing because of the risks that we see over the long term. But we still want to maintain our shareholdings in the fossil fuel companies so that we can act as long term stewards and encourage <coughs> them over time to transition into a low carbon future. So I'm just giving that as an example of how um, by focusing in one specific area, the world of investment, you can start delivering change change for the positive and bring a real focus where you can start seeing things um, improve. And I think over, over the years, um, I personally have been involved with um, very helpful um, discussions, engaging with the likes of Shell and BP to see how they are transitioning their business to take account of the sorts of issues we've been talking about into the long term. So I think that's all I want to say at this point, and I think, Leo, you're going to speak next. Thank you. Thanks very much. Hi, <laughs> it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Leo Johnson. Leo is an author and presenter, amongst other things, of Radio 4's Future Proofing program. He's also the co-founder of Stable Finance Limited, which is now part of PwC. Leo pinpoints the trends, he says, that connect sustainability to the bottom line, the climate change and energy crunch to customer preferences. Leo, thank, thank you very much. much. Thanks a lot. I've said so little because I really did not want to cannibalise what I'm going to say, which is, in terms of content, at least very, very small. That will take a long time, probably, to <laughs> elaborate. But, but, um, so look, yeah, thank you for that lovely introduction. I, had a, I set up a sustainability company that got bought by PwC in what I came to understand was slightly more of an acquisition than a full-scale merger between our organizations. <laughs> and before that, I was at the World Bank, uh, done a bit of writing, and then the future-proofing stuff is trying to look at the big stuff 
coming down the tracks to see whether we've got the rights to optimism. Are we going to navigate our way through it? Um, I don't know about you, I'm really depressed by what's going on with this, this <coughs> Syria business. I'm, 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 I'm deeply depressed um, about it and about, about our, our, responses, our responses. But what I'd love to do is throw out some stuff in relation to this um, question, playing with a couple of the comments that have come in. So, okay. Time and space and the challenges we've got. I want to, like Jeremy, throw out a, a quote to begin with from a, a philosopher, which is Marilyn Monroe. Okay, and she says this great thing, which is sometimes good things fall apart because better things are going to fall into place. And it could be that we're on, you've all done your economics, you've heard of Minsky moments. We're at not a Minsky moment, but a, 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 a Monroe moment, a Marilyn moment, where something clearly is starting to fall apart. That half of the equation we know is happening. And the question is, is the better thing going to fall into place? So what's, you know, we've lived in the city of Henry Ford. That was the 20th century. It was the car-shaped city, a city shaped by the general purpose technology of fossil fuel driven mass production, which kicked butt, which raised hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. We know that. But over time, it, of course, started to develop some side effects. And we have seen these pathologies. And of course, we've seen mass production shifting jobs off to low labor cost centers. So we've been left in the UK with broken, bankrupt, jobless debt-driven, cheap money-driven communities. We've, of course, seen that economic and social pathologies of that. We've seen the carbon pathology. And we know that it's not just the parts per million that we're seeing, it's the 200,000 people a day fleeing the broken countryside for the cities. And if you look at Syria, you know, we know that there's been five years of drought from 2006 to 2011 that helped to shift 1.5 million people in northeastern Syria, the breadbasket of Syria, to the towns, which of course did not cause the conflict, but it did not help. And it has not helped in other parts of the Middle East. And it doesn't look like it's going to help. We were just hearing from Rob Hope in terms of water security and the political risk around that. And if you just play this stuff together, you know, what you start to see is we're going to be living in a world where there are going to be 4.9 billion people, this is the estimate, in African and Asian megacities by 2035. And a lot of them are going to be young, and they're going to be poor, and they're going to be jobless. And they're going to be living in territories where there is scarcity of water and where crops are failing. And it's just not clear how you deal with that. And of course, we have a current model, which is you wait for that urbanization to happen. Then as the big city, the mega city crumbles, the petropolis crumbles of Nairobi, of Lagos, of Joburg, what you do is you build the smart city. You build the barrio cerrado, the gated community with 12 meter high electronic fences in which the businesses can protect themselves. And of course, the UK is in danger of becoming one giant barrio cerrado with borders that are impenetrable to those who do not have the wealth to buy their way in. And that's a possible scenario for the future. And you can see that in terms of the carbon challenge of that, just dealing with that, I'm involved with a magnificently turgid um, report on this that really tries to crunch through the numbers on are we actually decarbonizing? This is called the Low Carbon Economy Index. It's actually, it really tries to whack through the numbers. And the current rate that we've got to decarbonize or improve the carbon intensity each year is 6.3%. We've never really done more than about four globally ever. But it has to be 6.3% a year from now to the end of the century on our current run rate. By the way, if we meet all our Paris commitments at COP21, you know what percent we'd decarbonize? Three. We'd improve by 3%. So we have to double the hoped for Paris commitments to get on track for two degrees. If we don't start doing that, by the way, beyond about 2020, in terms of the time dimension, the cost of decarbonization tend up towards the limit. It tends up towards the amount. It's okay. So you can see that in terms of the space of the megacities, in terms of the time of that challenge, the stuff that makes you kind of scratch your head a bit. But I would also flip that around, because I can see that if you just look at the economic dimension of it and the technological revolutions angle, there's real currents that give you optimism. So if you look at energy with all due, you know, whatevers, 
for, 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 for Jeremy. Um, <laughs> respects and the things for Jeremy. Um, you know, we, th this is another, this is going to be the most boring bit of what I say, but if you look at the energy returns on energy invested, here, has anyone heard of that EROEI of oil? hundred years ago, when Ford was, you know, using mass production to get oil out of the ground and harness its magic power, um, the EROEI, 100 to 1. Just put your finger in the ground, bam, it came out, it's brilliant. Now, with, ta with fracking, with tar sands, with shale, with subsoil, it takes a lot of work and a lot of en clever engineering, but a lot of work, a lot of gas, a lot of cost to get it out. Your EROEIs have been going on a terminal nosedive. They're in the sort of 4 to 15 bandwidth around about now, and the break-even's around about 12. So what you don't have is a resource that's suddenly giving a massive uh, boost to productivity. So if that's one megatrend, there's this flip side, which is renewables, partly because of uh, the Chinese, the great heroes in this, um, have become really low cost. And they are going to be not just a really low cost, but a really low cost, zero marginal cost technology, where once you've got it in the in the, in the, in the roof, wherever it's going to be on the roads, it's just printing out your free, abundant electricity. And of course, VW, another hero in this debate, will accelerate that. And you've already got Tesla's, you know, Powerwall and the batteries giving more than 60 days off-grid um, battery storage for a US household. And if just one in 10 switch to the from the fossil fuel grid to batteries, the economics of the centralized, lossy, inefficient, 40-year-old, antiquated, coal-powered grid, that was a lot of adjectives, I know, piled up in one go, but the economics of that grid basically start to crumble. And the moment it crumbles, frankly, it's going to accelerate again the shift towards renewables. So you could see that there are huge grounds, if you just look at the technology, for optimism. But then I give you another quote from this Microsoft guy called Kentaro, Toyo uh, Kentaro Toyama, a former Microsoft research director who says technology is not the answer. It is the amplifier of intent. And the real challenge for me <coughs> seems to be the challenge of intent. Who do I think is the real enemy of business sustainability? And I get back, Matthew, to your great question. I know I'm sounding a bit like Nick Clegg, really doing the name checking and stuff here. But it gets back, Matthew, to your excellent question on, um, on you know, what's the business model? Because for me, at least, and I don't know if anyone agrees on this, uh, economics is a subset of philosophy. Economics and business models reflect a decision about what is the good life. What is it that we are solving for? What is the flourishing society? And it gets back to your question at the back, that I almost wanted to answer, but it was, I knew I was going to really bl blow my material if I answered it then. Um, businesses and VW... What is the function of a business? If you go back to the history of the corporation, what were the first corporations? They were doing prodigious things. They were mining out the critical resources people were going to survive on. They were building the railroads. The Pope was a corporation. The church was a corporation. You got a corporation status, and you got all the benefits that it gave you in terms of massive tax breaks, legal liabilities, longevity, the ability to transmit leadership across people over time, the ability to raise cash, to deliver your societally valuable enterprise. You got all that because you were doing something useful. You got all that because you were solving a problem. You got all that because you were built up as a corporation on the assumption, on the precept, that your business was interdependent with the world around it. Exactly what Jeremy said, that a business is only as healthy as the society around it is healthy. There are no jobs on a broken planet. The business was, and if we are going to have a hope, will still be there because it is solving a problem. A problem that is essential to creating a society that's actually going to work. So if you ask me, what is the real challenge? The real challenge is a philosophical decision about what is the good life. And it's one where I think there's a subtle shift that's going to be necessary. For all that the technology can help us, I think there is a bigger shoe that's going to have to drop, which is the philosophical shoe about our decision about the good life. What is a corporation for and what are we for? Let me give you Ruskin. The guy who turned Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi, into Gandhi, in Gandhi's own writing, was John Ruskin, 
who just asked this question, um, you know, what is the nature of wealth? And Ruskin's answer is, it's this. There is no wealth but life. That in the end, that is the thing that creates the well-being. What creates the well-being for us is not what we've had, the century of the self, where we're living in this neoclassical ideology that it is consumption for us alone that creates utility. And that is what we must maximize. What we know, and this is Amos Setzioni again, with his I, we paradigm, is that is not what constitutes the good life for us. If you look at all our lives in practice, we know that it is not that model of consumption for the sake of consumption that creates our well-being. It just ain't. And yet we allow ourselves to be educated and guided and led politically by leaders who act as though that is the sole thing. And the reality, I believe, is that it is through that independence amongst us and between us and our ecosystem that we know it's going to work. That is a philosophical choice that, if we get it right, will prove to be an enormous ally, that relationship with each other and with the ecosystem. And on that note, any of you who are still conscious, I'll stop. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, thanks, for, thanks very much for that, Leo, uh, and, and for the hmm? Well, a very broad church of topics that were touched on there from one week four backwards, I think. But um, there's some interesting themes there on investment and divestment of fossil fuels and so forth. Uh, so let's open it back up to the floor. Can I just thank the people for not leaving during my speech? <laughs> <laughs> so, any questions for any of the panelists? Yes, please. Hi, I'm Alison, first year geographer. Um, <laughs> um, with the governments looking at cutting costs of various sectors, how much money can we expect the government to put towards preventing and mitigating the worst effects of climate change? And how much will rely on private investment? And also, how do we get the public to consume sustainably? And what role does business have in this, apart from offering a sustainable product? Thank you. Who here makes their own stuff? Does anyone here make their own anything? <laughs> yeah, what do you make? I've made my own T-shirt. Nice. Are you wearing one? I'm not asking you to strip off and try. <laughs> Who else makes their own anything? What do you make? Skin products. Skin products. Amazing. What, do you, what, what, what type of thing? Fantastic. You do? What do you? Toothpaste. You make toothpaste. That is so cool. That's so cool. Do you use your own toothpaste? Yeah. That's the whole thing. <laughs> Just checking. Just checking. Just checking. And does it make you feel happy? Yeah. Does it make you feel happy what you're doing? <laughs> does it make you feel happy with your skin product? I make my own wine in Brent in North London and plum, and plum Slivovitz and all sorts of other goodies. And it just makes me feel like I'm not a... It's, at its most extreme, it makes me feel something of a, dire, of a directional movement from being just a consumer in a product in trash out Pito City, where I'm atomized, alienated, my job is to click on the Ocado button. It makes me feel that I've got hands I got some skills that kind of kept us going over the millennia. And I do it all with all my neighbors. I do it with about 80 neighbors. And it makes me feel that, actually, it makes me feel that I'm something, I don't exaggerate, but something close to a citizen in it. I don't exaggerate, but it actually makes me feel like I am an interrelational being. It's what it makes me feel. So, you know, just to get to that question, I think we must unlock the stuff that's been put down on top of us that is repressing these urges which are so primitive to us and so central to what we are homo faber makers and social animals and to do that you know that is the essence of what we are that is also i think the essence of what a sustainable good is that's the local good that's what we know how to do so we've got to get rid of the other stuff and allow that to flourish. That would be my answer. And make more toothpaste. <laughs> I want to see your toothpaste. I want to follow up with you, and I want to buy your toothpaste. <laughs> Thank you.
So I'm going to assume that um, whilst Leo is buying people's toothpaste and skin products, he still may need a mobile phone or something like that. So who in here has a mobile phone? Or who doesn't have a mobile phone, actually? Anyone? Okay, so just a thought as to, so your question, how could you have a sustainable model of consumption in the future for something as difficult as a mobile phone? So right now, today, we tend to buy a mobile phone, and at the end of its life, we tend to leave it in a drawer, right? And in 95%, so we, we, we leave it in a drawer once we finish with it. You can, if you want, you can post it back to a company. They'll give you some cash for it. So I looked into this a little bit. And what they do is they tend to refurbish your phone and they sell it into a secondary market, okay? So um, just to give you an idea, if you took your phone and recycled it, you'd retain 0.24% of its value. If you could refurbish it and give it to another person in another market, you would retain about 47% of its value. But this isn't really in itself that cool, right? What would be interesting would be if you never owned the phone any longer, <coughs> if you just owned a technology refresh cycle. So ultimately, in 18 months' time, all I want is a better handset, right? I want it to be more intelligent, to have faster processing power, whatever that happens to be. I actually don't want to be the owner of the rare earth metals and the plastic that that's made out of. And that's what a number of companies have now started to do. So what they're offering customers is they're saying, you can have the provision of a handset for 18 months at bronze, silver, or gold level. They then put, say, a million or 10 million of those products into the market. And then they know that in 18 months' time, they're going to get those products back. So the first thing that they might want to start to do is to say, how do I then design that product such that I can harvest the components or I can start to make it modularly upgradable? So for example, Google, you may notice, has bought a company called PhoneBlocks that Motorola owned, which is a business that makes a modular phone type device, which has modular upgrade for memory, Bluetooth, etc. So I think one of the I guess so I think Leo's point is very valid that ultimately consumers maybe need to change their behavior and that will have an impact. And I think in parallel to that, looking at different business models by which we would even shift from selling product to performance might even change the very way that we design products. And we stop being these horrible consumers as well. And we ultimately become citizens or users and effectively the economy moves on. Um, one of your questions, or one part of your question, was also about uh, the public and the private investment. Uh, and of course, it's going to be the and and. Uh, these things tend to work together. Uh, the, uh, the the business side and business sector uh, ultimately does most of the investment, or and channels most of the investment. But it does it within a <clears throat> a framework that has been established collectively through legislative regulatory action through through governments so uh, these sectors need to to work together to take things forward uh, and one thought that i would give is uh, in addition to uh, individuals as consumers and extending that as as leo suggested uh, is to consider the fact that collective action doesn't just come through consumers but comes through individuals as citizens uh, and the influence that that has on the political process. Uh, and working in an industry which naturally has to have time frames of decades, uh, the scenarios that I develop, because our impact goes out over decades, go through the whole century. Uh, no politician thinks about that. Uh, but under pressure, they will think about some of those issues. Uh, and that's where we as citizens can be knowledgeable and engage in shaping our collective futures as well. And, and just one small and final comment from me. I think um, the citizen as investor is something that should be explored more. Um, you only need one share in a company to be able to attend its AGM and you have access to the board, the chairman, the chief executive, the finance director and you can go and ask questions and I think the democratisation of the investment system is something that really um, should be concentrated on more by individuals. Most people in this room will either have their own investments or their colleges will have investments or their parents will have investments, and I think you can influence the way um, people are connected to their long-term savings 
and the ways business the way businesses are working for the long term. Thank you. Hi, my name is Emily. I am an MSc in the Water Science program. So basically, I'm kind of changing the scope of the discussion a little bit. Um, I really like focusing on youth work and how I get youth involved, especially in industry. And I want to ask you, this is the most socially and globally aware generation of youth, I believe. And how can corporations both further and foster this as they grow up? Because I think what happens is when you're young, you have a lot of ideologies and you really believe in them. And as you get older, you just stop. Because it's, <laughs> it's like, your parent, my, my parent generation, like they used to fight for like Vietnam and like being anti-Vietnam and now they're just like, oh yeah, I'm the head of a bank, you know? <laughs> so I just want to know like how you guys, especially in the corporate world, want to use that to your advantage. Like how, how much these kids know. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know, am I the oldest? Yeah, probably. <laughs> um, Should we tell? <laughs> Should we ask? The, the passion never leaves, I can tell you. Uh, uh, and so, uh, uh, I'm not the head of the bank, but I'm uh, equally as passionate, I hope, as I, I was when I was uh, as, uh, as young as yourself. Uh, I do think there are some important questions, and I, I know that there's uh, something, for example, that uh, one of my colleagues uh, has really championed and got behind, uh, and uh, is happening not under our name. We do a lot of work with um, uh, education, because you know, we, we believe that, you know, STEM education is very, very, very important uh, for our long-term future and for the world in general. Uh, uh, but also, uh, we recognize that one of the educational type trends that is facing uh, youth uh, with an increasing amount of capacity and information available uh, is that uh, you end up uh, kind of getting fragmented into particular silos of academic and other knowledge uh, and begin to lose the capacity to see how it all really fits together. Uh, and so we're strong believers in also, uh, if you like, systemic <coughs> thinking and systems thinking. Uh, so uh, we've worked with uh, uh, educational experts to develop uh, a series of case studies and a series of approaches towards encouraging system-wide thinking, uh, which uh, we put together thinking that people would, schools would pick it up perhaps uh, as a bolt-on after-school type of activity. But a number of different major school systems around the world are now picking it up and integrating it into their, their, their mainstream. So I think that that uh, ability to recognize so many issues of the world being system-wide and how difficult it is to access that uh, and, and try to educate towards that would be one of the things that comes to my mind from your, your excellent question. I think some businesses are now pulling together either youth boards or um, getting younger people to join their boards, um, not least when you see some of the other um, corporate failures around things like cyber security and you, under you can see that um, perhaps some of the board members are not up to speed with social media, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think, um, you know, whether it's how you tap into the knowledge of young people or indeed how you um, as a business need to respond to the changing needs and desires of um, young people in terms of the way they want to work, how they want to work. I think, it, I think it's a, a crucial thing to respond to. I also think we need to see um, in what I believe will become a much more collaborative world, um, people moving from the private sector to the third sector to the th um, to the public sector and sharing different models of work and working practice um, and um, some of the best organizations um, are already looking at how they work very differently with young people ensuring that they are getting early in their careers sabbatical to go and fulfill some of the things that they're most passionate about so that they don't lose that um, youthful optimism and, and desire to, to do things differently. Start up a company and disrupt the economy, that's what I say. <laughs> Just go for it. And then you'll bring in some older people later on when you need to. <laughs> uh, so we're getting pretty close to the witching hour at six o'clock in Oxford. 
Um, so I think, I think we'll draw it. We'll draw it an end here. Uh, just before we end, there is a post debate, post discussion, I should say, post, post discussion reception uh, over in the Gottman room. We bought a lot of food and goods, so few of those. Um, uh, I have a couple of quick thanks, if I may. Firstly, to Elaine and Jerome, who are in the room, without whom this event wouldn't have happened. So thank you for very much. Uh, but, but, but in particular, to this fantastic panel that we've had today, they've covered a very broad range of topics and they've, and they've shown some really interesting provocations. I really thank you for getting involved, asking the questions. And we've had a spectrum here from first year undergrads through to DPhil and postdocs and faculty. It's great to see so many people in this department getting involved in this discussion. But really thank you all very much for the panel and we can show our appreciation in the usual way.